most of you are familiar with Joanna Macy and her work. Is that true? Yeah. And so um, you know her phrase, the great turning um, that we're in the midst of now in the world. The great turning from an industrial growth society that is um, undermining the uh, foundations of life on the planet. So a transition from that to um, a life-sustaining society, or actually societies, and perhaps even uh, eventually, of course, a life-enhancing human communities. <clears throat> and Joanna speaks of three dimensions of the Great Turning and saying that all three are absolutely essential. You need to have all three. And uh, very briefly, uh, because probably all you know this already, the first dimension she calls holding actions, which are, in essence, uh, whatever we can do uh, in any arena to save as much uh, life in terms of m as many species and as much habitat as we can while the industrial growth society is collapsing, hopefully, sooner than later. Um, and the second dimension is, um, shorthand, is uh, creating new infrastructures of all sorts uh, for life-enhancing societies. Uh, the way we grow our food and where our energy comes from and how we educate and how we um, help humans, help ourselves grow into our full humanity. And the third dimension is, uh, she refers to as a shift in values or consciousness. Um, a, a change in our understanding of um, what the world is and, and who we are. This is essential. Um, so, you could say, uh, from my perspective actually, uh, maybe you agree, is that in some ways those... <laughs> I didn't need these anyways, but... Same case. Here, I'll put them over here. It's okay. Um, if all else fails... <laughs> okay, um, so that maybe the first dimension is most urgent, uh, saving as much life as we can, and uh, maybe the second dimension is right is right behind it and laying the infrastructure, which there are people like yourselves and people and organizations all over the world uh, creating the structure for uh, new ways of being human. And. Um, but for me, the uh, third dimension is maybe not most urgent, but uh, ultimately it's, the, uh, it's most foundational. That if it's the case, as I believe, that um, the reason we're in this very challenging time in the world, if, if that's because we've, the contemporary mainstream cultures have largely forgotten <clears throat> what it is to be human and how to uh, raise healthy children and how to become true adults and how to grow real elders. Um, if that's the case, and I believe it is, um, <clears throat> then ultimately to have healthy, mature cultures again, to reinvent healthy, mature cultures, uh, we need to attend very carefully to what it is to be human and how, to, how we raise children and support teenagers and ourselves to grow into our, our full humanity. So that is the the big um, experiment in our little way that we've been engaged in for 30 years now at um, our institute that's based in Colorado, <coughs> at, which is called Animus Valley Institute, um, because the, we're in southwest Colorado in the valley of the Animus River, which is Spanish for souls. So. Um, In some ways, uh, what Janine was um, is addressed tonight and does address in her work is um, a shift in consciousness that changes our understanding of what the world is, uh, and in particular that it's a, it's an animate world, that everything is alive, and uh, and if we can again experience the world that way, the world itself changes because of that, and we change as well. Now, my own work is, uh, in addition to that perspective, uh, my angle has been more on uh, shifting our consciousness of wh who we are, what it is to be human, Re in a sense, remembering again 
what it is to be human and to be grow fully human. And um, when we do that, again, the world changes. If we, if we change, the world changes. And so my feeling, my understanding is that there, we need, in the contemporary Western world, we need to help each other um, shift our understanding of what it is to be human. And in particular, um, our work at Animus has been uh, to reinvent contemporary versions of initiation processes. And one particular initiation process, because there's many initiation uh, initiations, and there's many passages in life and many processes. And uh, my understanding has become that there's actually nine nine major passages in life, and there's eight major stages that were designed by nature to go through. And our contemporary mainstream Western cultures uh, really only help us, uh, and poorly at that, get th through uh, three stages. And then we, there's too many, there's too large of a percentage of contemporary people who get stalled in stage three, which is early adolescence. So. <laughs> Early adolescence is not to be confused with our t early teen years. That our early adolescence is a psychological stage that starts in our teen years and is meant to end about the middle of our teen years. And that it tends not to end. It, the next major life transition is death. <laughs> which, which means the last major passage before that was puberty. Um, and adulthood what we call adult has become a slightly accessorized, polished uh, form of early adolescence. Um, and our mainstream contemporary cultures are fully support that. And you might even say have been very deliberately designed to keep people from growing past early adolescence uh, because we, there'd be no one interested in a consumer society that is uh, eating up the world uh, if people matured beyond that. So, um, so um, there's an initiation process. Um, birth is an initiation process for the mother and the child and the family and the community. And the next major passage in life is usually around age, between th age three and four, when we become conscious of ourselves as individual humans. Um, we, our conscious self-awareness develops and that's an initiation process. And then puberty is an initiation process into uh, early adolescence where uh, life becomes about peer group, society, uh, and sex. Uh, and, um, and the task in early adolescence is to develop a personal social presence in the world that is both socially acceptable to our peer group and authentic. And the authentic, it turns out to be the hard part in a conformist society. Think about that. So, I mean, it's relatively easy to uh, develop a socially acceptable personality if you don't uh, care about being real, if you don't mind being a fraud. And it's relatively it's easy to um, be authentic if you don't care about not having any friends. So. <laughs> If, if you're interested in both, it's, it's challenging in a healthy culture, and in ours it's really, really very difficult. So we tend to get stalled there, plus because of developmental difficulties uh, in the, fir the first two stages, which are childhood, um, we have a hard time, lots of so many people have a hard time with early adolescence. Okay, so our work is actually primarily for people who have had a healthy enough early adolescence, that they've made it through the next passage into late adolescence, which is a rare achievement in the contemporary Western world. And uh, that passage I call confirmation. And what's being confirmed is you've got a personality that is authentic enough and socially acceptable enough. And you have created a house of belonging, and a social house of belonging in your world that works. And you could spend the rest of your life living out of that house. Congratulations, now it's time to leave. Forever. Close the door, you can burn the house down when you leave. You won't need it anymore. It turns out that first house of belonging was just an exercise 
to show yourself that you can create a, a, a presence in the world that works. Good work. Now you're going on to the initiation process of discovering who you actually are on a deeper level, on a soul level, and uh, discover by that what you were born to do and to be. And by the way, what you were born to do and to be in this life is, has everything to do with the gift that was born with you or as you uh, that your people need and the world needs. And the, your community cannot be healthy without you and without your knowing what this gift is and embodying it in the way you live your life. And by the way, our culture cannot be healthy unless you take your place in it. And uh, the world cannot be healthy and without healthy cultures. So you're going to this initiation process. And it's not going to be a weekend workshop. It's, um, it's going to be several months at the uh, shortest and maybe several years. And there's no guarantee you'll survive. Are you ready? <laughs> <clears throat> So my understanding is that's what the elders always say in healthy cultures. Uh, Western civilization has, uh, uh, has been uh, going about the project for the last five to 10,000 years of finding the healthy cultures and destroying them. Uh, there's apparently a few left. Um, and, but as Thomas Berry says, our goal now is to reinvent healthy cultures. And his perspective was that there are no current cultures anywhere that alone can help us do that. We have to go back to the original source of the original seeds of healthy culture. And he says uh, what that is, is visionary experience. That's where healthy cultures come from, from revelation, from a, a number of individuals who are, live in the same community, each finding their own individual vision for their lives and uh, acting on that and embodying that, bringing that gift, and that creates healthy culture. So from this perspective, um, even a blue ribbon panel of uh, expert cultural design people cannot create a healthy culture. It comes, healthy cultures come from nature um, because a visionary experience comes from the, our deepest human nature. So, but we can, with blue ribbon panels of experts, we can create healthy adolescent cultures. And because uh, we don't have them now in the current mainstream. Um, and that's what, that is the desperate, urgent uh, project uh, that again has those three dimensions of the great turning. That uh, the project that we're all uh, um, um, putting our shoulders uh, against that, that particular wheel. Um, and essentially, a healthy adolescent culture is one that understands all of nature, everything as sacred, and uh, that we all, uh, that everything has a place, and that we, we must have a world where uh, everything has its own rights and so forth. Um, and that's a very urgent project, and who knows how many decades we have uh, time left to, to do that. So, okay, but back to the work and what we're doing at Animus Valley Institute, this experiment of uh, short experiment so far of 30 years of creating uh, initiation processes that are after confirmation, um, confirming again that we have an authentic, acceptable personality and also confirm that it's time to, to ask the big existential questions about life, namely, who am I really? What is the mystical gift I was born with or as? What, why is there death? Um, what is true community? Um, what is poetry about? Uh, what is the difference between romance and sex? Um, and so on. These, these big questions that healthy teenagers start asking, even in our societies, and usually don't find elders or adult initiators to say, yes, great questions. We're now going to invite you um, out of your everyday village life, and you're going to go into this process of initiation. So, um, and I call this the process of soul, soul initiation. And what I mean by soul 
is different than a lot of people, what they mean. And I'm not right about what I mean. I just have my particular definition. And you'll need to know what it is if we're going to talk about it. Um, so um, my shorthand definition is, by soul I mean a thing's ultimate place in the world. I say thing because not only humans have souls, everything has a soul. Everything has its ultimate uh, necessary place in the world. And we as humans are no exception. So for me, soul is to talk of soul is to talk about a kind of place or a, a niche or niche in the world. And uh, it's, for me, soul is not a substance. It's not even a metaphysical substance. Um, it's the place we were born to take. And the place is not primarily a cultural place. That's, that's where it kind of gets difficult, um, given what we've learned in the, our Western societies. Um, the place that we were born to take is not a particular vocation or social role. It's something that in the Western world we consider mystical. It's not really mystical. I think in a healthy society it would just be, yeah, well, of course. So it's something that you could say it's mythical. Our, this, our sole place is of dream, symbol, metaphor, myth, archetype, those kinds of things. And um, so the, the, this, the difficult idea that was really difficult for me to grasp for a long time is that we're each born to take a particular place, a unique place in the ecology, in our ecosystem first and foremost, that soul is ecological, it's of nature, that every place that anything has, including us, is a place in the natural world. And, and by the end of early adolescence, we have finally come to understand the kind of place we can take in society, uh, that the kind of job that might work for us and that the kind of way we might be known, to, the kind of personality we might be known as uh, among our people. That's cultural. Soul is, is mythic and ecological. So um, it takes a very profound shift in the way we think about ourselves in the world to go through this soul initiation process. And um, what we find in myths and traditions all around the world is that the soul initiation process is, um, has three major phases. And they are often... Um, illustrated by a you, a you uh, uh, shape. And uh, so it's phase one, two, three, and the first phase in the soul initiation process is dying. Uh, not physically, hopefully, or that can happen, but uh, dying to everything you understood about who you are that you learned in early adolescence and everything you believe about what the world is. It all has to crumble some of it will come back, but you don't know which pieces. So the first phase is dying or severance. And the second part of the process is, you could call it being dead, or betwixt and between, or uh, just the underworld uh, time, or the sacred world time, where our consciousness is, it's more like moonlight consciousness, and everything has these multiple uh, challenging meanings. Whatever we encounter is not fully, not, you can't fully understand it by our first um, take, in that things are symbolic and uh, have meanings. Um, so there's the dying process to who we thought we were. There's the gathering of the uh, dream, the vision, the myth of our life, which is not cultural. It is uh, uh, more of the mythic. We call it the uh, mythopoetic dimension. And then there's the third phase of returning uh, back to our everyday life with as much of those symbols um, and, and deeper meanings. The purpose. Another way to speak of soul is it's our, uh, the, the true deepest purpose of our life, uh, the meaning of our life, which is, has everything to do with the place we were born to take. Um, and once we return, um, the next thing that happens is um, we need to find ways 
to deliver that gift to our people or to the more than human community through almost always some cultural role or vocation or job uh, and so forth. So then the job, beca- the task is how am I going to bring this mystical uh, meaning, understanding of who I was born to be, how am I going to deliver that? What, what cultural, what jobs would count as that? So, um, let's see. Here's a poem. Um, you can talk about these things forever, and at some point it's like, what? It's, it's difficult to talk about this briefly. Um, so, but some poems often will, will uh, fly beneath the radar of our everyday conscious minds and, and sneak in where just um, other talk doesn't work. So this is a um, piece from a uh, British poet uh, whose name is David White. How many people know David's work? A lot. That's great. Um, I believe his mother's Irish and he was raised in what part? Northern? Yep. Yorkshire, and uh, he's been living in the U.S. for many years. Uh, And this one is called um, All the True Vows. All the True Vows. And in this poem, there's uh, two truths and two promises that you can keep your ears open for. And the two truths turn out to be the same truth. And the two promises are very different promises. And if you make one, you can't at all ever make the other. Um, not ever, but you can't make them both at the same time. Okay. I hope that gets you curious about the truths and the promises. <laughs> um, here it is. All the true vows are secret vows. The ones we speak out loud are the ones we break. All the true vows are secret vows. The ones we speak out loud are the ones we break. I'll step over here for editorial comments. I'll try not to make too many during the poem, but I wanted to connect the dots here with um, the process of soul initiation. Soul initiation is a process where we have to make that kind of vow at some point, the kind of uh, vow that that needs to be a secret vow at first. Okay. All the true vows are secret vows. The ones we speak out loud are the ones we break. There's only one life you can call your own, and a thousand others you can call by any name you want. Hold to the truth you make every day with your own body. Don't turn your face away. Hold to your own truth at the center of the image you were born with. Those are the two truths. (laughs) And they're the same truth. And it's, 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 a, it's a mystical thing, I think, that these are the same truth. Hold to the truth you make every day with your own body. Don't turn your face away. Hold to your own truth at the center of the image you were born with. <coughs> the truth at the center of the image you were born with. Those who do not understand their destiny will never understand the friends they have made nor the work they have chosen, nor the one life that waits beyond all the rest. By the lake, in the wood, in the shadows, you can whisper that truth to the quiet reflection you see in the water. Which truth? (laughs) The truth at the center of the image, okay. By the lake, in the wood, In the shadows, you can whisper that truth to the quiet reflection you see in the water. Whatever you hear from the water, remember, it wants you to carry the sound of its truth on your lips. Remember, in this place, no one can hear you. And out of the silence, you can make a promise it will kill you to break. That way you'll find what's real and what is not real. I know what I'm saying. Time almost forsook me and I looked again. Seeing my reflection, I broke a promise and spoke for the first time after all these years in my own voice. Before, it was too late. 
to turn my face again. Let's turn my face back towards the truth. Remember, well, right, sorry, whatever you hear from the water, you've just, spoken, you've just spoken your truth to the water, which is a common metaphor for nature, nature itself. You've spoken your deepest truth as you understand it to nature. This is, this is essentially, this is a, the vision quest stanza. By the lake, in the wood, in the shadows, you can whisper that truth to the quiet reflection you see in the water. Whatever you hear from the water, Remember, it wants you to carry the sound of its truth on your lips. Remember, in this place, by the lake, in the wood, in the shadows, <laughs> in this place, no one can hear you, and out of the silence, you can make a promise it will kill you to break. <laughs> it's a humiliating thing if what you hear from the waters is a cow. <laughs> But the, the process of soul initiation ends with the promise it will kill you to break. And the promise is, I will carry the sound of that truth in my lips through the rest of my days. Remember, this place no one can hear you, and out of the silence you can make a promise it will kill you to break. That way you'll find what's real and what is not real. I know what I'm saying. Time almost forsook me, and I looked again. Seeing my reflection, I broke a promise and spoke for the first time after all these years in my own voice before it was too late to turn my face again. So um, when we're young, um, maybe even younger than you, maybe when we're just like three years old, we make a promise that we forgot, we don't remember that we made. And the promise we made was, I agree not to sing in my true voice if I can get psychological and social safety in exchange for that. And it's exactly the right promise to make at that tender age. That if we don't make that promise, we're not going to survive to ever enter the initiation process. We have to. It's part of being human. We have to make that promise that I have to fit in culturally first. And I have to fit in my family. And if my family's not so healthy, I'm going to have to uh, put a, a bigger lid on more of me. But if my, even if my family's healthy, I'm going to have to have some lid on um, embodying my, my true wild magnificence. So we make that promise. And during the initiation process, at some point, we have to break it. We have to uh, agree that we're going to speak in our true voice. We're going to sing our true song. And through that, we enter into a conversation with the world that um, goes through a, a phase towards the end of the initiation process where we discover what the largest... This is another phrase from David White. We discover the largest conversation that we can have with the world in this lifetime. Um, and so my understanding has become to have a truly mature, healthy culture which, uh, and to reinvent one, is, that's a process of several generations. None of us in this room are probably ever going to live in such a culture. Um, but we can uh, live in a healthy adolescent culture. But to live in a, a truly mature culture, it's a visionary culture, and it's, um, it's one in which um, every child uh, is supported uh, to get through early adolescence in a good way and to enter the soul initiation process and to find each of us, to find our unique uh, part of um, our unique contribution, our unique way of participating in a healthy culture which helps create such a culture and um, such cultures... Um, help not only sustain life, but enhance it. So, um, one really brief example um, of a mythopoetic identity. Uh, one of my favorites, it's from literature, it's from poetry, and it's um, from William Butler Yeats. Um, you remember the guy from the, uh, the island next door? And uh, 
It's uh, one of his famous poems, uh, Song of Wandering Angus, and I just want to remind you, I just want to recite the last of the three stanzas. Um, by the way, if you ever get a chance to look carefully at his poem, The Song of Wandering Angus, it's not, not a cow. It's Angus is the um, Irish god of love, beauty, and youth. Um, do you have cows in England that are called Angus? Okay, so we do in the States. Okay. So... Um, the first stanza is The Severance. It's an amazing poem this way. And the second is The Moonlight uh, Underworld Time. And the third is The Return. And I just want to recite the third that uh, many of you will know already because it ends with Yeats's, I believe, is Yeats's mythopoetic identity. He wrote this poem in his late 20s. He lived into his mid-70s. Uh, so the last stanza is Oh, it's going to refer to um, his having met his anima, uh, or his soul, his inner beloved, in the second stanza. This is, what it, this is the her in the third stanza. Although I'm old, with wandering through hollow lands and hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone, and kiss her lips, and hold her hand, and walk among long dappled grass, and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. And pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. So uh, my take is that uh, who Yeats really was, this is my opinion, but it might be shared with others, is he was an apple plucker, in essence. His, his mythopoetic identity had everything to do with these, the symbolic significance of the sun and the moon. And he spent his life plucking those apples. And you'll see it in many of his poems that he wrote later after his late 20s. And you see it in his final uh, work, which is a, a book of um, uh, prose called A Vision. Anybody ever read A Vision? Yeah, and it's a, it's a book about um, the sun and the moon and what that me has come to mean to him in his long life, which has to do with the uh, masculine and the feminine, among other things, and the relationship uh, between and how that's played out in the phases of the moon. So that's an example. Um, we could say, okay, Yeats was someone who spent his life plucking those apples and that was his mythopoetic identity. His cultural delivery system, very different, on a whole different level, was uh, poetry, uh, essays, novels, and a book of metaphysics in his 70s.